A successful crash landing back to Earth seven years and a handful of days after it was launched, OSIRIS-REx returns home with the all-important samples of asteroid Bennu. Within 90 minutes, NASA teams had secured the payload and moved it to a temporary clean room at the Utah Test and Training Range near Salt Lake City. There, it's under a constant bath of nitrogen to avoid earthly contamination. Your deep dive into OSIRIS-REx and the only podcast to speak with NASA scientists on the ground in Utah is right here on Trexites Talking Science. It's Monday, the 25th of September, 2023. I'm Matt Miller. These are the science and space headlines about OSIRIS-REx you need to know now in this special edition. Celebrating 20 years of Trexone, this is Trexone's Talking Science. NASA's first sample return mission has returned to Earth. Its important payload back on terra firma after a successful atmospheric drop into the Utah desert over the weekend. Seven years and 15 days after launch, OSIRIS-REx's sample capsule returned home, filled with rocks and dust from asteroid Bennu, which it reached two years ago. The near-Earth asteroid was the target for the American Space Agency, following in the successful footsteps of Japan's Hayabusa missions. The returned samples collected from Bennu will help scientists worldwide make discoveries to better understand planet formation and hopefully the origin of organics and water that led to life on Earth. I spoke with Kelly Fast, a NASA program scientist, just before the successful return on the other side of the weekend. Kelly, thanks for beaming into Trexone. It's an exciting weekend coming up for you guys at NASA. Oh, it really is. It's been a long time coming, so it's very exciting. Now, give us a brief background on OSIRIS-REx. I mentioned it in Talking Science. It is NASA's first sample return mission. Why is it so important and uh, what are the specifics of what you're hoping to achieve here? Well, it's the first sample return mission from an asteroid. And the idea is to be able to actually see and study in the lab a sample from an asteroid that you can you can connect the sample to that asteroid, to that uh, population of asteroids that it comes from. It can teach you something about the origins of the solar system because asteroids are the leftovers of the formation of the solar system. And so to study the chemistry and to study the composition can tell you so much more about the history of the solar system and about how some of the uh, uh, properties of, of Earth came about delivery of water and organics from asteroids. And the best part that I love is that this isn't humanity's first sample return mission. Uh, JAXA, the Japanese space agency, have had great success uh, landing back here in Australia of their capsules from Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2. Uh, what else can we learn? What's different about asteroid Bennu uh, compared to where we went to, uh, where, where Japan went to? Yeah, that's been fabulous to have so much collaboration between the teams and to learn about uh, uh, the uh, different uh, experiences with sample return uh, between the two teams. So that's been so wonderful. And the, um, uh, uh, they're, they're similar and they're different. Uh, we saw that the shapes of these asteroids were similar between uh, Bennu and Ryugu because they were rubble pile asteroids that are pretty much held together uh, by gravity and shaped by their spin and their motion. Uh, uh, but also there's different composition. There's some different histories to them. And Bennu is a uh, carbonaceous asteroid. It's carbon rich and by targeting such an asteroid uh, and studying its properties. Again, going back to that idea of how did some of those organics come to Earth, to be able to study that composition, uh, carbon compounds and, and water uh, uh, bearing uh, uh, rocks on Bennu. Uh, it's, it's that opportunity to, to look at all of that on this particular asteroid uh, because of that target uh, 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 science question of how did some of these organics uh, eventually make it to Earth. I remember covering uh, the story when uh, OSIRIS-REx uh, made that contact with Bennu uh, and I remember that it was so successful that uh, you couldn't close the sample capsule. Uh, obviously that got resolved. How much material are you hoping uh, to see this weekend? Oh, it was, it was mind boggling um, to, to watch the whole uh, sample acquisition process and to see the rocks flying afterward, everywhere. And then to see um, that that uh, capsule was full and there were, <laughs> I saw a meme out there of like a squirrel trying to, uh, <laughs> to take in as much as it could. And so there's, um, uh, uh, there's, there's, you, you know, I can't remember the exact weight of the sample that's coming, but we're, 
we're talking on the order of grams that will be uh, studied in the lab to be able to, you know, again, look at what is the chemistry of that sample and uh, what, what, are, what is the composition. Uh, again, we study meteorites, things that fall to earth, but we can't always connect those to particular, we certainly can't connect them to particular asteroids, uh, except in very rare cases, and they get processed through the atmosphere. So to be able to take that sample and button it up in the way you said uh, in the sample return capsule and bring it through the atmosphere to the surface uh, and then be able to take it to the lab. It, it's just, it's going to be huge to be able to have that quality of a sample to study. And I remember with uh, Hayabusa 2 covering that story as well, that there's there's not a lot of material here. We, we are talking in terms of grams, uh, but there is enough to <laughs> share uh, with international partners uh, and plenty uh, to learn as well, as well as keep some uh, stashed away deep and secure. Right, NASA missions uh, uh, we always value uh, opportunities for international collaboration. And so to be able to uh, share those samples with mission partners and with uh, uh, researchers, uh, the sample is going to be brought back to uh, NASA's Johnson Space Flight Center, where uh, it will be curated there. And from there, it will be, uh, uh, they will manage uh, the uh, research done on the samples with uh, uh, researchers around the world. And so it's, it's, it's going to be one of those opportunities for science to just happen for, for years to come. It's going to take a long time to, to kind of unpack everything that has, has come back from that mission, both uh, uh, the, the, from the rocks themselves and then from the research for years to come. Hopefully the next sample return mission uh, will be sending uh, humans to the asteroid belt and not just another robotic mission. Well, that would be fabulous. Actually, for exploration, uh, the nice thing about Bennu, it's a near-Earth asteroid, so it comes closer. It makes it easier uh, to get to it than the asteroid belt. Um, and also, you know, NASA is going back to the moon and being able to, uh, to actually uh, do geology there in person. And so, like you say, to be able to, uh, uh, you know, it's one thing to do it robotically, but that would be fabulous one day to be able to have uh, human geologists actually uh, doing that kind of research. And so it's great to have that kind of on the on the radar for the future one day. Well, I spoke with Jason DeWalken, uh, who was a project scientist uh, at, the, at uh, NASA a couple of years ago uh, as um, all of this was happening, as the sample was being captured. Uh, so I am expecting him and everyone else, including yourself, uh, to be very busy over the next couple of days. Uh, good luck to uh, good luck to everyone. Uh, and I can't wait to see that parachute deploy and that sample uh, to be picked up uh, and uh, ready for analysis uh, by all the wonderful people at NASA. I wish I could be there this weekend. Unfortunately, uh, I couldn't get the international flight over. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for your time. And yes, the, the OSIRIS-REx team is, is giddy, I'm sure. They just cannot wait uh, to get their hands on that sample. And uh, one journey is ending and another is just starting. Well, back in May 2021, I spoke with senior scientist Jason DeWalken at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, just as OSIRIS-REx began its return voyage to Earth. Jason, a huge milestone achieved this week with the successful full throttle burn of the main engine to bring the spacecraft home. Uh, yes, uh, so it was yet another perfect maneuver uh, by the Sashrex spacecraft and the Sashrex navigation team. Uh, the spacecraft uh, did a uh, main engine burn to depart the region of Bennu and it's on the way back to Earth. It is very exciting. Now it's going to take two and a half years to get here. And what I find incredible is that you already know when and where it will land. Obviously some pretty serious maths goes into those calculations. Oh, the, the flight dynamicists are remarkable in what they can do and what we, the information we get back from the deep space network on the Doppler ranging. Uh, so they actually take into account all, all objects in the solar system. Uh, even the gravitational effect of, of, you know, Mars and, uh, uh, the moon, Pluto, it's all factor in there, factored in there. Uh, it's really amazing uh, what they can do. In fact, the, uh, the location, the landing, the biggest unknown is the weather in Utah on the landing day. Well, for something that's two and a half years downrange, that is absolutely incredible. Now, to be fair, um, we, do, we do course corrections the entire way through. It's not a main engine burn and we're done main engine burn sets the, the spacecraft in the vicinity of Earth, and then we tune that as we go along. 
Um, that's just a whole lot easier. And we have lots and lots of time for and schedule for uh, uh, cleanup burns just to, to adjust things just a little bit if necessary. That's how these are all done. Uh, all, all the spacecraft missions you hear about, there's, there's some wicker room in there to make sure it's perfect. We'll flash forward two and a bit years and the sample capsule has returned to Earth. It's safely back on terra firma and now inside a temporary clean room at the Utah Test and Training Range near Salt Lake City where it's under a nitrogen perch. For more on that and to dive into the next steps, senior scientist Jason DeWalken beams in once again. Welcome back to the show, mate. Where has the time gone two, year, two and a bit years since we last spoke? Uh, it's been a busy time and a bit of hair loss, but um, here we are. Uh, it's been an absolutely perfect day. Uh, the capsule came down an amazing location. Uh, no issues, no problems. Everything's been wonderful. Uh, we got the uh, uh, the sample canister on, on nitrogen purge, which is used to keep out, out air from getting inside. And um, we're now going through and doing the, the last... Uh, uh, preparations to get it loaded onto the airplane uh, to fly tomorrow to St. Johnson Space Center to begin the 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 slow, deliberate process of opening up the canister and getting the sample ready for uh, the South Rex science team and the international science community. Well, congratulations to the entire team. Sadly, the return was deep in the middle of the night for me, but uh, what's the atmosphere like over there? Uh, everyone must be buzzing. Oh, it's very jubilant. It's... Um, uh, I, it it couldn't have gone better. It's just remarkable how well it, how how wonderful the spacecraft has behaved. Uh, the the navigation was perfect. The capsule came down. There were some some string things that were unexpected, but it landed right by the, right by the road. Um, who, who would have thought that? Uh, very easy. Uh, samples collected. Uh, it rained a few days ago. We were a little worried, but it landed in a. Um, in an extra dry patch, uh, it, was, it was great. Uh, we have samples from the from the collection area, just in case material got inside. But from the look of the ca of the interior of the capsule, it looks secure, no breach. Uh, we'll find out much more details in the coming days, and there will be a big reveal on October 11th. Is the plan to uh, to tell the world what we found as we start slowly opening up the layers upon layers of protection to get to the sample. Just incredible. I remember with Hayabusa, I remember chatting with you as well, that uh, this mission has gone from success to success. Uh, and it's just absolutely incredible. You you really are lost for words about how everything's, uh, how everything's gone. And that success after success amidst challenges. So uh, as, as you've heard, uh, the, the sample collection was a challenge. Uh, the asteroid was much rockier than we had uh, believed. Uh, it turns out that the data that we had on the ground before launching was correct. Our interpretation was backwards. And uh, Bennu has, has, as our PI likes to say, uh, is a trickster. And so we will see how tricky the sample turns out to be when we open it up and, and look in detail. Looking forward to but that. But the, the place is buzzing with excitement. That's why you can see I'm in, I'm in a kitchen right now uh, where I can find a quiet space to to have a conversation because uh, the everywhere else is, is busy with people. Absolutely. And I do appreciate your time, uh, you know, just mere hours uh, since that return of the capsule. Uh, you mentioned the nitrogen purge. I mentioned it as well. Uh, why is that an important first step uh, in securing the payload? So uh, we're, we need to have a sa uh, sample that is uncontaminated from the environment. Uh, one of the potential contaminants is, of course, dust and uh, um things from biology, but also water. Uh, one of the things we learned from Hayabusa 2 is how rapidly sample from Roo uh, start to corrode. And we'll see how, if that happens with Bennu, but we know we'll be safe. And so getting it on a, a, a flow of dry nitrogen keeps out contamination from getting inside, including oxygen, moisture, dust, um, what organic vapors, whatever, keeps it clean. As you say, October 11 is going to be the big reveal for the international community, uh, for everyone at large as well. Uh, next steps are to get it back to the Johnson Space Flight Centre. Uh, Jason, I'm going to let you go because it has been a massive day and your job's not done yet. You've got to fly home with it nope. as well. And I'm on purge watch tonight to help make sure that uh, we, we have the Dyson purge connected and uh, I'm taking a power shift to make sure that it stays connected, nothing goes wrong. 
I guess it's a precious sample and um, it's worth doing. So very, a long way to go still. Very, very exciting and very, very important uh, next step. So I better let you go and do that and prepare for that. Uh, prepare a meal as well, Jason, while you're in that kitchen. <laughs> Jason, thanks very much for your time. We'll talk again uh, as uh, more as the onion layers are revealed on this sample. Cheers. Thank you. Alrighty, on to the week's other headlines now. Early galaxies followed a formation rulebook, but Aussie and international researchers using the James Webb Space Telescope now believe these rules have been dramatically rewritten during the universe's infancy. The team looked back billions of years to a period shortly after the Big Bang when galaxies were first forming and found galaxies from the early universe followed the same set of rules when it came to the formation rate of stars as well as their mass and chemical composition. According to the study, the most surprising discovery was that ancient galaxies produced far fewer heavy elements than we would have predicted based on what we know from galaxies that formed later. The discovery challenges existing theories about galaxy evolution and raises questions about the mechanisms at play during the universe's formative years, opening the door to further exploration about the cosmic processes that influence the development of early galaxies. Earth's rotation is usually perceived as a constant motion, but when you zoom up really close, you can find small differences that change the length of an entire day ever so slightly. Traditionally, measuring these effects involves complex techniques using data from radio telescopes scattered across the globe, or signals transmitted by multiple Earth orbiting satellites. However, a team of Kiwi and German researchers describe a laser gyroscope that can detect minute changes in the length of a day, resulting from changes in the Earth's rotation, accurate to a few milliseconds over four months of measurements. The authors suggest their findings offer an alternative method for measuring subtle variations in day length compared to what exists now. A team of international researchers led by experts at the University of Adelaide have uncovered further clues in the quest for insights into the nature of dark matter. And the key to understanding this mystery could lie with the dark photon, a theoretical massive particle that may serve as a portal between the dark sector of particles and regular matter. Testing existing theories about dark matter is one of the approaches that members of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Dark Matter Particle Physics are pursuing in order to gain more clues into this elusive but highly important substance. Analysis of the byproducts of the collisions of particles accelerated to extremely high energies gives scientists good, uh, good evidence of the structure of the subatomic world and the laws of nature governing it. The team, which includes scientists from the University of Adelaide and colleagues at the Jefferson Laboratory in Virginia, USA, has published its findings in the Journal of High Energy Physics. Well, we are on uh, YouTube, podcasting, and across every podcast app as well. Find each of Trekzone's shows on Google or Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, tuned in, and more. Plus, Trekzone's channel in the iTunes library gives you a one-stop shop for all of our goodness. So jump onto your favourite podcast app, find Trekzone, and subscribe. On YouTube, membership continues to be available. Early access for less than a cup of coffee per month. And, of course, our social media feeds always have the week's podcast highlights. And Star Trek episodes are coming back soon. A huge thanks to NASA's media team for opening the Zoom windows to us for our extended OSIRIS-REx coverage. I can't wait to see what reveals are ahead October 11th. Pin that date in your calendars. This is our 20th year to the world. We are Trekzone, going boldly since 2003.